What do black beans, bronze pots, and bad energy have to do with one another? Hey friends, happy May. Spring is in full effect, and we've just passed the Celtic holiday of Beltane or Bieltana, which is typically celebrated on or around May 1st. Bieltana is one of eight holidays celebrated in the traditional Celtic calendar, the Wiccan calendar, and various other spiritual and magical traditions. And it has a lot of different aspects to it, including the thinning of the veil. So what's that? Celtic tradition describes that liminal space between realms, especially the realm of the living and the realm of the dead, as a veil. It is thought that at certain times of the year that veil becomes thin, which allows for communication between realms, which otherwise would have been, if not impossible, at least very difficult to achieve. So one of the times of the year is Samhain, or, you know, we celebrate it as Halloween, and the other is Bieltana. So at the beginning of May, it is said that the realms are easily accessible, the veil becomes more porous, and so you get a lot of activity having to do with the dead and the ancestors and so on and so forth. So why am I bringing this up? Well, it turns out that the Celts were not the only ones who associated the month of May with the dead and the ancestors. The ancient Romans celebrated a festival during this month called the Lemuria, or the Lemuralia, and the purpose of this festival was to contact the dead for specific reasons that I'll get into in this video. So what was the Lemuria? What rites were celebrated during this festival, and who participated? And most importantly, why was this a festival at all? In this video, I'll be talking about the history of this festival and its rituals, and a little bit of the reasoning behind the tradition. So before we get into the Lemuria, we have to talk about the Lemures, the spirits involved in this festival. Now, ancient Rome had a lot of different names for different types of spirits. I'm not going to get into all of it here, but you might see the Manes, the Lemures, which we'll talk about, the Larwai, or another one, and you could even classify the Lares, the Penates, and the Genii as spirits. So all these different types of spirits, but this festival had to do primarily with the Lemures. The Lemures are not just any spirits. Specifically, they are vengeful spirits. The spirits of those who died an untimely death um, or a violent death, maybe those who were not given proper burial rites, and who are basically walking on this realm, this plane, the world of the living, because they don't have access to the afterlife or because they have some unfinished business to take care of. This is one consequence of improper burial, is you get these hauntings, you get these ghosts that cannot move on because they haven't been taken care of properly. So this is why the Romans made such a big deal about burying people in the right way with the correct rituals and the correct offerings and all of that to ensure not only that their loved ones would be able to move on in the way that was most natural and desirable, but also because you don't want to be haunted. And if there are spirits that have not been able to pass on, well, where are they? They're in your house. <laughs> um, so when the Romans talk about haunted houses, which is not very common, but they do occur, this is what they're talking about, is these Lemures spirits. Now, all of these spirits are formless. They don't have a figure. They're not, like, anthropomorphized. You probably can't see them, although that's a guess on my part. And like I said, they are liminal. They exist kind of in this in-between space between the world of the living and the world of the dead. So if you think about the afterlife journey in Greco-Roman mythology and Etruscan mythology and so on, there is a definite journey, a route that you have to take. It, it's a spatial journey. You go from point A to point B. So 
if you don't get to point B, you're somewhere in the middle. That's where these Lemures exist, is in this sort of in-between space. And it's kind of um, an unpleasant state to be in because you're you're not quite one thing, you're not alive anymore, but you're also not quite in the afterworld. Now, you may be thinking that this word Lemuris that I keep saying sounds a lot like those sort of like goth primates from Madagascar, uh, and you would be correct. They are named after the Roman Lemuris because they're nocturnal, they move a little slow, they've got those neat little rings around their eyes, make them a little spooky looking, although I think they're adorable. So yes, they are etymologically related, but they don't have anything to do with the Roman Lemuris at all beyond sharing a name, and they are not involved in this festival. Just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, so the festival of Lemuria is also called Lemuralia, just alternate names for the same thing, and it takes place, as I said, in the month of May. Now, it's a little bit unusual because it takes place on three days, but not back to back. So it takes place on May 9th, May 11th, and May 13th. I don't know why this would be the case, but there must be some sort of reason that I haven't quite found yet. Ovid doesn't know either, so I don't feel that bad about it, but if you have any ideas, let me know. Now, if you thought May was all about springtime flowers and warm weather and sunshine and happiness, think again. May, in the Roman mind, is an inauspicious, unlucky month because of its associations with the dead. Now, it's actually named after the ancestors, the Maiores, um, and usually the ancestors don't have a negative connotation to them, but for whatever reason, maybe because of the Lemuria festival, this month just gets a bad reputation in Rome. Now, one of the consequences of that is that it was considered unlucky for people to get married during the month of May, and any woman who got married in May was risking a premature death. Maybe, you know, to join the Lemures is one of those unfortunate wandering dead. I'm not really sure, but it was said that women who marry in May are unlucky, and so the practice was generally avoided. Now, I thought this was interesting because in the Celtic tradition and in the modern Wiccan tradition, May 1st, Bieltana, is actually considered like one of the best days to get married. So yeah, just a little bit of a cultural difference there. So the entire month of May was considered bad luck for weddings, but especially these three non-consecutive days of the festival. During the festival, all the temples were closed. There was generally an air of mourning that went around because we're talking about the dead. The whole city kind of just settled down a little bit because we have to take care of these hauntings, these like restless, vengeful spirits. And that actually is the purpose of this festival is to get unwanted spirits that may cause you harm in some way, whether it's minor inconvenience or like a major catastrophe, to get them away from you and especially out of your house. You could think of it as like a banishing festival. The rituals are designed to free your house of all of the negative energy that was brought in by spirits that shouldn't be there. So this is not a festival about kicking grandma out of the house, right? If you have ancestors that have passed away but have been treated properly, they've received proper burial, and you think that they are going to be helpful or you want to maintain a relationship with them, this is not what the festival is about. Those are not the spirits you're looking for. We're talking about the mean ones, the ones that want to hurt you. But that being said, there may have been another reason for this festival, and that is to help your ancestors who may be in that unfortunate situation. Not all improper burial is a result of either neglect or just a lack of desire on the family's part. Sometimes people don't get buried properly for various reasons. If you're a sailor and you die at sea and your body's never recovered, you know, having the physical body is part of the proper burial, so it just can't be done. So part of this festival may have been to sort of help these spirits get where they need to go, and then the positive outcome for the living is that they're no longer being haunted by their great uncle that they didn't bury properly. Now, the only complete description of this festival is in, say it with me folks, Ovid's Fasti. 
the gift that keeps on giving. So it's in book five, and I'm not gonna go through the entire description, but I will put a Latin version of it and an English version of it in the description if you're interested. And I will be using his description when I talk about some of the rituals and practices that go along with this festival. So Ovid says he doesn't know where the Lemuria festival came from, how it got started, or why it even exists in the first place. But in his poetic way, he calls in assistance from Mercury, and Mercury tells him the whole story. Now, I should note before I tell this story, this is just Ovid's theory, and it doesn't really come up anywhere else, so this may be one of those times that Ovid is just filling in a gap. So anyway, he says that this festival originated with Romulus and Remus, the twins who founded Rome. Romulus ends up killing Remus, and as a result, Remus is one of those unfortunate souls who died an untimely and violent death, especially um, because it was at the hands of his own brother, his twin brother. So as you can imagine, his spirit is not very happy about this. So he proceeds to haunt Romulus, and then Romulus sets up a festival called the Remuria, and then Ovid says that they didn't like the name, so they just changed it to the Lemuria. Whether or not this is the actual origin of the festival, there are some interesting thematic parallels between the Romulus and Remus story and the Lemuria festival. We've already talked about Remus being killed, so his death is untimely, violent, at the hands of a family member, but it also brings up the notion of not doing right by your family members, especially your deceased family members. So in the case of Romulus and Remus, Romulus's murder of his brother, followed by the neglect of his ceremony afterwards, is the reason why Remus's spirit is unappeased. In the Lemuria festival, the spirits that you're dealing with are not just random spirits that somehow wandered into your house. They are your ancestors that have not been pleased with the way that you've been treating them, whether that's lack of burial rites, general neglect, you know, failing to give them offerings, failing to include them in important family milestones. You know, like I've said in other videos, the ancestors and their images were generally brought to weddings and other funerals and stuff like that. So if you've been neglecting that, maybe grandma's gonna be upset with you and she's gonna come back and haunt you. So these are the spirits that we're talking about. So the Romulus and Remus story may have like a symbolic connection to it, even if it's not the actual origin of the festival itself. All right, so let's talk about the main customs. Now, the primary activity of the Lemuria festival would take place in the household and each family would do it individually. And in fact, not even the whole family would be involved because the ritual would be led or carried out entirely by the pater familias. So the ritual takes place at night, and the first thing that the pater familias has to do is to wash his hands in spring water. This is a ritual purification. This is fairly common among all cultures, having some sort of like pre-ritual purification. A lot of times water is considered to be purifying, so this is the first step. Now as he's washing his hands, and in fact as he's carrying out the whole ritual, the pater familias would look down, right? He wouldn't look at anything around him, he'd keep his eyes down. And this is to avoid making eye contact with any unfriendly spirits. He would also do a gesture with his hand that involved like putting his thumb in like his closed fingers. I don't know like what exactly it would have been like, whether it was like this or like this, or I'm not entirely sure. Um, if anybody has any thoughts about that or knows more, I'd love to learn. But there was some sort of protective warding gesture. Once all of that preparation was done, then the ritual could begin. The Pater Familias would take black beans and either throw them behind him or spit them out of his mouth, again, not looking, right? So eyes down, throwing the beans or spitting them out of his mouth without making eye contact with any spirits. And then he would bang pots together. I get Ovid says bronze, but I imagine whatever cooking pots you had and would go around the entire house doing this. And this was supposed to get rid of any unhappy ancestral spirits. So the black beans were probably an offering to the spirits in order to appease them, 
and then banging the pots together was probably designed to scare the spirits away. So you've got a little bit of a carrot and stick method here, where on the one hand, you want to appease any spirits that might be angry with you by giving them an offering, but then also scaring them out of your house because you just don't want them there. So Ovid lists two incantations or maybe prayers that the pater familias would recite as he's doing this. The first is, Haec ego meto, his redimo meque meos que fabis. And that translates to, I send these away, maybe send the spirits away. With these beans, I redeem me and mine. So the verb here is redimo, um, and it can be translated a bunch of different ways, some or all of which I actually think might apply in this situation. Typically, it's translated as redeem in English, and this can mean in the sense of like redeeming a coupon, or redeeming in the sort of grander sense of redemption. It can also mean to buy or purchase, maybe to buy a little bit of freedom, a little bit of peace and quiet in your household. I don't know, maybe I'm making a leap with that one. It can mean to save or rescue. It can mean to ward off or avert, get rid of. And lastly, it can mean to atone for a wrong that has been done. All of these, I think, have their own place in this ritual. Uh, so redeem kind of covers everything, but I really like this sense of atoning for a wrong because that is one of the themes of the festival, is making sure that an injustice, whether or not you carried it out, is made up for, and the spirits are able to get past this roadblock in their journey to the afterlife. So that's the first incantation, and the second one is much more simple. It just says, Manes exite paterni, which is, ancestral spirits be gone. Now Ovid says that each of these incantations are repeated nine times. I don't know much about Roman numerology. The only thing I know is that they were really into it, so I'm assuming that this number nine has some sort of symbolic significance, although I'm not sure exactly what it is. Again, if you know, please let me know. And that's the main activity of the festival. So once the pater familias would complete this ritual, theoretically the spirits would be gone and the family can be more at peace knowing that there's nothing haunting them any longer. Like I said before, it's essentially a banishing ritual or you could stretch it a little bit and say it's a house cleansing ritual. So if you were going to celebrate this in modern day, I would say maybe if you're gonna blend it with like modern witchy wisdom, maybe do this ritual and then follow that with like a, a warding or a protection or something on your house. That would be my guess, like the best way to do this. I don't, there's nothing in the literature that I've seen that has like a, a follow up to this ritual where it's like a protection ritual for the house, but I would guess that maybe that's included somewhere. But yeah, if you wanted to celebrate it, that would be my advice. And that's all I've got for you today. Uh, there's not a lot of information about this ritual. Like I said, Ovid's version is the only complete description of the activities, and it's still pretty short and leaves us with maybe more questions than answers. But nevertheless, I hope you found this interesting and useful. If you like this video, you can let me know by leaving a thumbs up down below. And if you want to see more stuff about Greco-Roman belief, religion, mythology, uh, magic, anything to do with that, I'm posting videos like this on my channel all the time, so feel free to subscribe if you'd like to see more. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate you, and I will see you in the next video.